uh, attention. So I know, uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, Women in uh, Milcom uh, Networking Social Event. So I, I hate to interrupt your discussion right now. So you can stay where you are, have your drink, have your snacks. Yeah, feel free. This is really a, a informal kind of a social networking uh, networking event. And I, we do have a few uh, women speakers here uh, to give some remarks. You are feel free to um, yeah, come on. Yeah, come on stage or come closer. Well, you, you can stay over there. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. And uh, <coughs> I, I am uh, Christine Zhang. I have been involved, uh, participating in Milcom for, I would say, over 10 years, 12 years. And yeah, I know many of you. Uh, and I also meeting uh, lots of new friends. So I really appreciate you all coming over. This is actually the first time we ever hold a women's networking event. And uh, you see uh, lots of women engineering uh, in the community. Now it's really a good chance to, to get everyone together. And I do appreciate all the gentlemen coming over to support us, right, to have a good chat on this. Um, so, oops. All right. Um, this is just some logistic about the event uh, holding, uh, uh, holding uh, happening right now. And, uh, and also I do appreciate uh, FC uh, to, to help us organizing the event, putting the wonderful reception, uh, open bar and all the snacks over here. So I really appreciate yeah, the support from FC as always. And uh, now I just want to take this opportunity to invite a few, uh, a few uh, women leaders in the community to share their aspect, uh, their career uh, goals, you know, th their career advancement in the, the, in the, uh, the Milcom community, um, not just limited to military communication technology itself, actually lots of their personal experience and uh, lesson learned, right? So, so if you see that, we have uh, four uh, uh, distinguished uh, speakers, and actually we have fifth one, Pam. Uh, we just met today. Pam is actually a CEO of a company, so I will let her introduce her more on her experience. So those are the uh, women. I mean, it's just like a small representative percentage. I know lots of uh, great women leaders in the community, right? So I do welcome uh, everyone really like improv standing up and uh, speak about, yeah, share your experience with us. So this, again, this is a, a kind of informal event. I just want to promote women participation in this community and also, uh, yeah, to promote more, more engagement, right? Uh, attract more women engineers to, uh, to the community. All right, so some of the uh, talking points, I like to see how this event will, uh, will happen is like the, so those are the talk, talking points we put together. So each of uh, our speaker will uh, pick and choose, emphasize, yeah, take a, a couple of uh, talking points to, to share with us uh, your experience. So without further delay, I will just pass over. Maybe let's start with uh, alphabetical order. Julia first, <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. Please don't be shy. Come closer. <laughs> you're, I think you're allowed to carry your wine glasses with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. It's uh, my absolute pleasure being here. I really don't like talking about myself, but I couldn't say no to Christine, <laughs> who organized this event. And um, so my background is um, I... Uh, my bachelor's is in electrical engineering from Drexel University. Uh, the concentration track was telecommunications. And my master's uh, track was in uh, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. So <coughs> I've been uh, gainfully employed by the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I know that's a mouthful. People start nodding after Johns Hopkins, <laughs> but no, no, please wait. <laughs> so um, 
I have over 18 years of experience in uh, wireless systems performance analysis. I'm an IEEE member. Uh, I think I'm too lazy to fill out my you know, IEEE senior member application. It's like hanging unfinished there <laughs> in ether. Um, so I, um, I have some um, publications behind my belt and uh, I also um, co-authored in 2013 uh, a book on a uh, technical book on wireless networking and if uh, if you're interested in uh, chatting with me uh, please feel free to email me uh, the information is provided um, on the slides that will be shared I presume right um, how do I advance to the next So um, just wanted to highlight some of my, I guess, uh, I feel like I had a lot of proud moments in my career, but unfortunately I cannot talk about them. Uh, <laughs> some of them I, I'll say in very generic terms. Uh, I was leading uh, a team for a large EW program and my team and I, we were building um, jamming techniques against advanced commercial uh, technologies and uh, sometimes when you do the work you do the testing and you submit the technique uh, to to our um, you know armed forces and then you don't hear the feedback but got to hear the feedback that our techniques have saved lives from uh, remotely controlled improvised devices so that made me tremendously proud and you know you know, we saved lives in um, uh, foreign theaters. Um, my most fairly recent adventure was with uh, <coughs> DARPA Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. Uh, I served uh, from the JHU APL side, I served as a project manager, but we were w uh, in talks with DARPA for about a year and a half and doing the research and all kinds of great technical discussions. So um, it, it's been tremendously challenging um, to be in that role because uh, uh, probably ended up having nine functional teams, uh, over 50 engineers working in a very fast paced environment. And um, I don't know how familiar you are, but. Uh, DARPA recognized the spectrum crunch problem and DARPA being the innovator that it is uh, wanted to start developing novel spectrum sharing um, approaches so hence the DARPA spectrum collaboration challenge and so along with DARPA and national instruments uh, JHUAPL built a the largest in the world RF channel emulator uh, that had 256 by 256 MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, um, and, you know, the largest in the world channel emulator, uh, which was uh, appropriately called Coliseum, and that was the arena for the uh, Spectrum Collaboration Challenge performance to test out their cognitive radio networks. So, um, so what I've learned, lessons learned, I learned how to be extremely flexible. I also learned that sometimes an 80% solution is better than a 100% solution, but at a later date. And um, sometimes I, I'm a, I, I feel like I'm a perfectionist by nature. And sometimes, and we are, you know, in technical field, we we try to be problems. We are we are the problem solvers. So. Sometimes, you know, you have to realize you can't solve all the problems on your own and you have to trust your teams and you have to delegate. And, um, you know, you have to realize when it's time to ask for help. So um, that was, I guess, for me, I transitioned out and pursued other opportunities. But <clears throat> I also wanted to touch on my uh, technical book uh, publication. Um, I don't know. You know, it was an arduous three-year process. It was done predominantly on my own time. And um, it was definitely an exercise in willpower. And 
I don't know whether I would be able to do it uh, or whether I would <laughs> recommend doing it uh, without having some type of family or friend support. Um, I had three little children at a time. I had two four-year-olds and a five-year-old, and I was working full-time, and, um, and, you know, and then whatever free time I had, I was uh, spending in library and studying uh, the technology so I could write a chapter, chapters as an expert, you know. <laughs> I had to learn the technologies, then write chapters on them. And, and unfortunately, those technologies are outdated now, or, you know, not uh, mobile WiMAX, fixed WiMAX. I mean, I know there are niche applications, but LTE at that time, you know, after that, it won the war. <laughs> so that's, that's me. I think I ran over my five minutes. And Hello, everyone. Okay, so I didn't prepare any slides because I didn't want to go through the public release process. <laughs> so I figured <laughs> I would just say a few things. Um, so my name is Ritu Chada. I'm Senior Research Director at Prospecta Labs. I'm sure many of you have never heard of Prospecta Labs. Um, we've only been in existence since June of last year, but uh, when I joined this company, we were known as Bellcore, which was a descendant of Bell Labs, so maybe some of you have heard of that. And uh, so that was in 1992, and uh, uh, when I tell um, new hires that join our company how many years I've been with the company, and they tell me, well, that's older th than, I've, than I am, <laughs> that makes me feel uh, really old, but uh, um, so uh, I, I joined Belcor and uh, we, you know, we were given basically uh, some, some kind of project to work on and you could do anything you felt like, you could publish, you could, uh, you know, take your time, you could work with uh, universities and basically do whatever you want. And, and things have changed a lot since then. So. Um, around the around 2001, when the dot-com bust happened, uh, we uh, we had a big layoff, and uh, I'm I'm in the research part of the company, and they laid off one third of uh, research, and so that was kind of a a wake-up call for us, and uh, we realized that we really couldn't be dependent on internal IRAD funding for our survival because research is the first thing to go, and so that was one big uh, you know uh, turning point. In, in my career where we had to suddenly um, move and try to figure out how we were gonna generate our own funding and obviously we turned to government funding and it takes time. It's not easy to uh, you know, generate money. You need to know uh, the right people, you need to know the, the right agencies and uh, you know, it, it takes time to uh, basically write the proposals and generate the money and hire the right people. And so that was, that was a big learning uh, um, point for me. Um, another thing that maybe I'm most proud of in my career, I would say, is um, about a decade ago, I was asked to start the machine learning department in our company. And so uh, we, we really had very few people who even knew what that meant. And so it meant going out and hiring the right people and learning and uh, uh, you know, trying to build it up, and I think we've done a decent job. As as you all know, it's really hard to find talent in that area because uh, you know Facebook and Google and uh, Amazon, <laughs> uh, you know, swallow up all the all the talent. But I think we've done a good job, and uh, you know, really made a name for ourselves in that area. So I would say that's another thing that um, I'm really proud of. So in terms of what um, you know, my lessons learned, I think it's just that change is always gonna happen. And I think we're fortunate to be in a field where uh, th there's a lot of change and it's very dynamic, but also you get a lot of you know, opportunities to learn new things. And so uh, people ask me, so you've been in the same job for 27 years and you're not bored? And I'm like, it feels like a new job every day. You know, it's uh, always new things and you have to learn new things. And I think that's what keeps it interesting. So I would tell anyone, you know, uh, if, if, if you're in this field, make sure you're in a job where you can learn new things and, and work on, on new projects. Thank you.
I'm sure in your experience, actually, I started my career at Bell Lab. So a few years later than you, I totally appreciate your comments uh, about all the things changing, right? I think the most important thing is uh, you have to be adaptive, right? Be agile all the time. Yeah, no matter where you are, big company, small company, government, or academia. So, uh, all right, so let's welcome another uh, Julia, another Julia on the stage, yeah. First, okay, my name is Julia, a little bit about me. So my name is Julia Zhang. I have, okay, I'm the, okay, R&D is, okay, woman engineer first. I'm the woman engineer, just like all of you here. And uh, then I work in the R&D field for DOD for 15 years. So, and uh, my research background is more on networking, wireless networking, in all kind of networking, plus, and uh, cybersecurity. You know, both networking and cybersecurity has been hard for many years. So we are in the research field, chasing the all the, okay, the, the money results for many years. Okay, yeah. And then another role I'm playing, so in the company, I'm the senior director there, okay, managing a group, the group called Networking and Cybersecurity. Actually, I'm the early, early person who found that group. And the group now, we have about 50 people, so 50 people, okay, scientists and engineers. And then, so another role I'm playing, I'm the mom, I have two girls, okay, one is eight, one is really young, it's okay, so it's less than one year old. So, okay, so you can see that's okay about me. And then, okay, so, so when, okay, Christine asked me to talk about woman engineer, I try to see what we should talk here. As an engineer, everybody here, I think they have some technical background or even not technical background, you work on some, okay, the field, research field. So as a woman engineer, what is special as a woman engineer? I want to share some of the experience I have. As a woman engineer, first, you know, we work in the, okay, so engineer field is a man-dominated field. And uh, definitely, I think that, that brings a lot of challenge to us. So let's see, I, I quickly look at, uh, okay, Wikipedia, or just look at the website. So I think uh, now if you look at 20% of the, okay, the people is, okay, in the STEM field is a woman, that's woman engineer, 20%. If you only talk about engineer field, that's, I think, uh, even, okay, smaller. So in that man-dominated field, then how women can survive? So there's a lot of challenge we are facing. For example, there's a okay, lack of encouragement, right? And also, okay, lack of visibility. And also there's a peer pressure. And also I think uh, you have your really, really busy life. So there's a lot of love challenge. I can mention many more. But I want to share some real, my okay, personal experience with you to give you the, the challenge here. First, I want to see peer pressure. So I remember a long time ago when I started, okay, so my career in the company. So at that moment, um, I was, uh, okay, trained in the, in the in engineer school. Then, so then I don't, okay, I always, I have a lot of, okay, close friends. So you know, really the, okay, girlfriends together, they always, okay, so go to the shopping, right? Okay, try to buy some beautiful clothes. And then I also do the same thing. But when I start working, I feel, okay, my life become busier. And a lot of, okay, friends, they still continue the way. They're chatting about the fashion. They, okay, go shopping, buy, 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 buy all kind of clothes. For me, because I try to make close relationship with them, then I also try my best to follow them. But, okay, after a while, I realized I could not. I could not catch up with them because first one is that my time didn't allow. I have a lot of technical work to do. Second one is uh, even I bought a lot of clothes. So a lot of time I didn't wear them. I put it in the closet. Then, okay, so I give you some, okay, some, okay, a very, okay, embarrassed moment I, okay, I did once is, uh, that's early times, so when I w okay, get to the, okay, work, that day I bought, a, okay, very beautiful clothes, it's a dress, okay, that day I feel so happy, I dress up, I dress when I went to, okay, work. Then, okay, so I had some meeting there, after meeting, I then walked the hallway, probably most people didn't notice, you know, the engineer department, right, a lot of people didn't really, they didn't look at you. And then suddenly when I walk on the hallway, there's one colleague see me. He said, he's so surprised. He said, Julia, what happened today? So there's anything special today? That make me feel embarrassed. I say, I see nothing special. <laughs> okay, then, okay, I passed. 
So from that okay, day, I realized first, okay, so I could not catch up with all the friends and then I gave up, keep buying stuff. But I also changed my mind a little bit. I also, I feel, okay, I don't want to always a jeans t-shirt. I want to change the way I, okay, I look. Then I started to try, okay, try some, okay, try some new clothes, more pretty clothes. But I feel the lesson I learned is after you try a period, people will get used to that. Then nobody start questioning you. So I still encourage everybody, whoever the women engineers, if you just, okay, for using the old style I used, now dress up, dress prettily, because people will get used to it, they will not feel surprised. That's, <laughs> right. That's one experience I have. Then in terms of busy life, I also want to share another experience I have. So our company is a, is a okay, it's an R&D company doing uh, for all the different government agencies. So I mentioned that we're chasing the money source, right? So writing proposal is one of the, our major job duties. We write every year. We write many many research proposals. So okay, I think a DoD. I don't know who is the person who manages the proposal submission process. In the early stage, I think if let's say talk about okay, um, even okay five years ago, for long long time period. They put the deadline, always a deadline, after January 1st. So whenever we come back from the, okay, the New Year holiday, that's a proposal due date. So that, I know, I understand the government side, right? So because they are taking a vacation and then come back, they want to have time to review proposals. But that triggered a lot of difficulty for the, our industry side. It's because every the holidays, okay, Thanksgiving, uh, uh, the Christmas, plus New Year holidays, we're always there. Okay, so we don't have holidays, we always work on proposals. That make our love, life is really hard, hard to that. So I think somebody raised the is issues to government, finally they change it. I feel so happy for that. But you can imagine my life is uh, so, how difficult at that moment. Oh, okay, so Christmas and the New Year, we work on proposals. Yeah. So I think that's some example I shared, but that's the challenge part. I also want to pass the, okay, the experience is, uh, so don't think a challenge can stop you, because challenge never stop you. You always treat challenge as opportunities, because I think every new challenge that become opportunities. The reason, okay, the really the, okay, the issue is how can you change a challenge to uh, opportunities, and also how do you face those opportunities? How do you overcome the challenge? So I also want to okay share a little bit okay about that one. So so one thing I really want to say okay if you face your challenge I want I hope you and along with me can face it up. Really don't scared about the challenge. You think you can do it. So you will okay surprised to see how capable you are when you really I think pass the okay the challenge period. Right, so in terms of that, and also I think uh, whenever you pass a challenge, you also feel, okay, you will feel so thankful to those challenge because that make you stronger. So in terms of that, I also like, want to, uh, people to see, okay, so you first, no matter what, you need to work hard, right? Work hard is fundamental. You have to show, okay, your capability and earn respect. So I know some of people, some of the women engineers talk about, okay, so because I'm in the men dominated field, then men sometimes look down to girls. Looks like, okay, you, sometimes they look down that way. But I, I think for me, my experience, okay, all my experience is very positive. I didn't feel that way. So and also, but still, no matter how, okay, people think about you, you should show your capability. When you show that, you will earn respect. That's what I feel. Second one, you should trust yourself and trust your family, trust your partner, trust your colleagues, and trust your company. So that's what I also want to see is that trust is a fundamental. When you trust people, then people will trust you. Sometimes if the issue comes, it's not really, okay, people don't understand you. If you don't trust people, you don't share your feeling with okay, other people. So in terms of that, I also want to see, so I think uh, one experience that I had is um, I was pregnant. I think, uh, okay, so another, I think, uh, 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 you know, I think uh, I was pregnant in a company. And then, okay, so at the beginning, I was a little bit scared. I don't want to tell. I always feel, okay, when I okay, said that way, so people may feel I'm not capable, I cannot do much work. And then I had one bad experience I lost. I lost as a mi miscarriage. And then, okay, so that's why I think I learned the lesson is really you cannot hide yourself. 
try to trust people. Then, okay, so I'm lucky I got the second time I, okay, was pregnant again. And uh, this time I learned, okay, I tried to share. And uh, whenever I address this, okay, my situation to the, okay, my manager, you know, I got fully support. The manager said, okay, Julia, you have been serving this company for many years. You can do whatever you do if the medical needs. So I feel, I also found this experience to you is don't hesitate to ask help. Don't hesitate to share your feeling. You will get support. I think this community is really supportive. I want to see that. And then, okay, so then the next one is, okay, offload yourself. I know as a woman engineers, you need to balance your work, balance your life. You have your kids to take care. You have work, so try to offload. But the, your question is how to offload. Okay, still fundamental trust. You trust your coworkers. Sometimes you just give some task to them. They will help you to do it. Sometimes you learn how to offload yourself. Whenever you offload yourself, you also grow yourself. Actually, you learn to be a manager to become, okay, you can manage, lead people. So yeah, for that one, and uh, I also personally I feel, okay, so in a lot of cases, women, okay, by nature, they have a lot of good, better communication skills. So that one I feel is uh, try to use the minority benefit. As a woman, you are minority, but use the benefit of that. And then I feel you can work closely with all your colleagues. And also you can, okay, really do a lot of things. Even, okay, you can lead people there. So that's, okay, my feeling. Yeah, so finally, I think uh, I want to see, that's my experience. I also, I talk a lot of the, okay, the women engineer here. I particularly talk with Teresa. I think Teresa is very, very senior people. And uh, I would like to ask her to share some of experience she has, because I feel she has much more experience than me. So Teresa, come here. Are you social? Yes, I think, yes, it's most social event, yes. So Mel Kahn, thank you for doing this, FCA. Who's an engineer here? Who's, who, okay, lots of engineers. Who are cyber professionals here? Okay, so kind of about half and half. Okay, so um, I will say that um, I have been active duty. I've been a defense contractor, and I now serve as a civil servant. So what are my two biggest things of coming in was coming in the Navy, the United States Navy, to serve the United States Navy. Amen. Go Navy. Woohoo. Okay, that's number one. Um, and everything associated with that, that's like 99.9999% men. Right, and it was in a time where it was before tail hooks, so there were a series of challenges. But guess what? You treat people with respect. You treat people as you would want to be treat treated, right? And that turned into be, you know, it's not only the golden rule. It is, <laughs> but it worked. It, it really worked because it's hard. You know, you're sometimes the voice in the dark. Okay, and part two was FCA, joining FCA. Um, as a professional organization, I think was life changing. And I'll tell you why. There's some guys, raise your hand, guys. Palmer, Neil. Who else is AFSIA here? <gasps> AFSIA, okay. What an incredible organization. And I'm not doing this as a slapstick for coming up here and, and talking. I will say that you need to join a professional organization, whether it's IEEE, whether it's MOA, whether it's whatever. I chose AFSIA. You need to, as a woman, or as a man, but choose a professional organization that you want to put your hat on because that's part of your professional demeanor. You need to build your professional demeanor, right? Because that's what you are. You're part of your, in your professional life. You also have your home life. You have your dog life. You have your husband wife, your children life. You have all these hats that you wear. But it's really important, I think, to um, remember where you came from. Remember those who are junior than you to pull them up pull them up, you're going to have lots of opportunities, male or female, in this room to pull up people who are quiet, who are standing in the corner, way in the back, whatever, and pulling them forward and into the group. And I, it's a challenge to you, everybody in this room, to do that. Anyway, I'm not going to talk long. Um, and what was the other thing I wanted to highlight my strategy? You already know that. Work-life balance. I'm not a woman engineer. I'm actually an IT professional. I'm a 2210. I was an IP professional, information professional as a naval officer. Um, I was in cyber security. I am, and right now, we're for the Navy authorizing official for Fleet Cyber Command. 
Um, I love my job. I love the people I work with. And it is challenging as a woman, right? So one of the things I said at our table was, if you're standing, and this is for the men and the women in the room who are senior, and you have a junior voice, a junior person in that room say something, acknowledge her, empower her, because she's not going to have a voice, and she's not going to stay in your organization. She's going to find someone who cares about what she has to say at another place that's going to pay her more money, that's going to respect what she has to offer. So please, Consider that when you have a position of responsibility that you really do, you're humbled because you're pulled into that as well, and it's how you treat others. General, did I get that right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time. share your experience. Uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed this uh, pop-up. Yeah, let's talk about, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Um, so I'm Karen Haig. Um, I got a PhD in artificial intelligence at Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University a few years ago. Um, the photo there has uh, a typo on it that I will come to by at the end of this conversation here. Um, my accomplishments, I kind of have three or four that I, I'm really proud of. Uh, first, of course, is in a, in a PhD, if you, when you get a PhD, you have to be the first person in the world to ever do something. And it is only time that tells you whether that work was relevant to anyone. Um, so what I did was I am the first person who took a traditional AI planning system. So I actually, I built a route planner, think Google Maps. Um, and I built a task planner, so what am I going to do first and then second and then third? And I put it on a mobile robot, an indoor mobile robot that wandered around our building and it did office delivery tasks. And then it analyzed that execution to learn from its experience and then improve the planning site and planning steps. So I'm the first person to close the planning, execution, learning loop. Um, and if you think about, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, and if you think about autonomous vehicles and your Google Maps and all of that, it's all, I mean, it, it's, it's critical in all of those areas. Uh, the second thing that I'm super, accomplishment I'm proud of is that I was um, involved in the initial concept design all the way through uh, initial prototype, fielding clinical trials, and a business, a strategic business acquisition when I was working for Honeywell Research Labs um, for doing passive behavior monitoring of elders in their homes. So the idea is most elders get institutionalized because their kid is afraid of something happening. I'm worried that mom is going to fall down the stairs. Uh, Daddy, I don't think dad's taking his pills. We don't know. Typically, nothing has actually happened, but the person gets institutionalized. So the system we built was monitoring. Are you taking your meds? Did you, are you flushing the toilet? Are you eating? Did you get up this morning? And it was all passive, so you didn't have to wear a bracelet, or, and we didn't have cameras. It was all motion detectors and contact switches and what have you. We were able to show with only 11 elders in our field trial, we showed statistically significant improvement in the memories of the elders. This led to a strategic business acquisition by Honeywell. And if you look around now, it's not like you can look, go to you know, Home Depot and buy the system kind of anywhere. But Best Buy has something on their shelves that's kind of in this area. And you see lots and lots of w research being done in this, in this space today. The third significant thing I have is that I, um, I, my, most of my work, as you can tell by the first two examples, is putting AI in physical systems, things that actually interact with the environment. The third area is for a cognitive electronic warfare and electronic protect, particularly for electronic protect. I, and I built the first real world system, not a simulation, that control, used AI machine learning to control a manet in the field. 
My system is flying today, doing real-time in-mission learning, you know, in mi millisecond time frames, and it's actually doing on novel communications environments. Um, so I'm actually in the process of, speaking of challenges, writing a book on cognitive electronic warfare from the perspective of AI. I'm, I, you know, I don't care about the platforms per se, but from the, what are the AI technologies that are relevant in this space? My biggest challenge in my career is that I look out there and I say, oh, here's a thing that we need. And it's, oh my goodness, I know we have a way of doing this. I tackle it, and it turns out I'm typically too far ahead. When you think about AI for RF systems, I started doing that in 2003. Where are we today? You know, how many systems out there that are using AI to control a network, even to do the signal understanding? The number of systems is pitifully small. Okay, and so for me, the lesson that I learned there is that it will eventually catch on, but you have to be utterly tenacious and just keep attacking it. And you know, you'll get there in the end. Some, you know, people will will finally the choir will start finally listening to the preacher. Um, so uh, that and. Uh, the second significant lesson I learned over this time frame is how to delegate. Um, so there's the, there's the ability of, uh, you, you know, you can just ask someone to do it and, well, how much do you actually need to check on them to make sure that they're coming back? I, I live in Minnesota where um, people always talk about Minnesota nice. Turns out that a lot of Minnesota is actually passive aggressive. It's not really <laughs> nice. Um, and, you know, people will say they'll do it, but they don't actually mean it. So in that environment, you're looking at um, how, how often, you know, each individual needs to be checked on at a certain frequency. And how do you determine that? Um, and being able to pay attention to the cues. You know, I, start, I had examples of people who worked for me that I wasn't checking enough and others that I was almost micromanaging. And during that experience, it's like, well, you know, when you delegate, you know, what you get back might be better than what you did. It might be worse than what you did. But the key point is that you didn't have to do it. <laughs> and that's really useful. The final um, important thing, I think, uh, and this is true for any, um, any, any person who is, is trying to tackle tough problems, is that you have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to stand up and say, I accomplished something. Um, and, and, you know, really stand up and stand up for yourself um, and make it clear to other people what your benefits can be. So now I'm going to come back to the typo that was on my slide. Um, I am frequently too far ahead of uh, the environment that I work in. Um, I have been for the last 18 months working as an AI strategist for L3 and now L3 Harris Corporation, which we just went through a merger. Well, the impact of mergers is that you're frequently focused more on cost savings, tactical activity, and not the strategic thinking that'll take a couple years to implement. So, as an effect of the merger, I am currently unemployed. And putting myself out there, I have resumes. I am seeing hands. <laughs> sharing your experience and also sharing your, you know, dramatic change happened last, just Friday, I can remember that. Just a Friday. So yeah, really, so actually, this is a like networking social event and I, I happen to get to know Pam. Today, actually, Pam came to uh, Milcom at least three times, right? But I guess I s met you before, but I never got a chance to know you. And, and today, we met, and Pam is, uh, is, is actually CEO of uh, Long Linear uh, Corporation. So I would like to invite Pam to, to share your experience as a women entrepreneur. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so the first learning I have is don't get cornered by Christine <laughs> when she's got a seat short. I promise I'll keep mine short and sweet. I cannot in any way, shape, or form 
the advice, the knowledge, and the experience sitting on this panel today is inspiring. The advice, the knowledge, and the experience sitting in this audience is inspiring. Seize that moment. Seize that opportunity to shake someone's hand. Seize that opportunity to introduce yourself, to put yourself out there. There's two pieces of advice because you don't want to hear about my accomplishments, you don't want to hear about my education, but I will give you the two pieces of advice that I have lived my life by that have gotten me to where I am today. Number one was from my dad, and I've been talking to a couple of you guys. My dad was one of the original coders. I, had, I knew what computers were before most people even knew what a computer was. I have one in my home. I could make a dot matrix printer say, Pam is cool, Pam is cool, Pam is cool. And when I tell people that I had an acoustic modem in my house, they look at you and go, a what? I said, back when you had to take the phone and put it down onto the computer and you heard, ee I said, I was so inspired by that. And they went, you're a girl. Okay. I walked into my first college class. Are you sure you're in the right classroom? but you're a girl. My dad looked at me when I was eight years old and he said, promise me one thing, honey. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something because you're a girl. And I never have. Whether it be education, whether it be industry, whether it be in the military, army, sorry, hua. Um, <laughs> we weren't going to go there. I was going to let you have your Navy moment. It's okay. That's all right. But that was the number one piece of advice when I was young. Don't let them tell you you can't do it because you're a girl. The second piece of advice that I will leave you with today was actually said to me by my drill sergeant. Now, we all, those of us that are veterans, have emotional memories of our drill sergeants. I really have one of mine. And he looked at me and he said, soldier, can't is a state of mind. Because I had looked at him and said, Drill Sergeant, I can't do that. And he said, can't is a state of mind. To this day, when somebody told me, you can't start a company, somebody told me, you can't code that system, somebody told me, you can't work with that organization, I look at them and say, can't is a state of mind. really appreciate it, Pam. Yeah. Actually, all right. There's another scenario uh, that like women uh, CEO in the audience earlier, uh, Rachel, right? I mean, I don't see her now, but uh, I just like to open the floor and you want to ask any questions or promote some discussion on, on, on women. I think one thing is uh, really appreciate all the comments you made sharing all the different aspects, right? I think most important thing is uh, how we empower women, right, in, in the community, right? How, how we can be more resilient in some way. So I yeah, do appreciate all of you coming over. Uh, yeah, do, is anyone want to stand up, or ask some question, or, yeah, or initiate some discussion or share your own, own experience as well? All right, anyone? Or oh, we need more wine. <laughs> Okay, so let's, yeah, continue the wine and dine, you get more snacks and we, maybe we can check more. And also the reception is, uh, is right outside, right? So we can in and out, yeah. So we have our special uh, setting here, which is appreciated. So yeah, so we, you can also welcome to work outside, it's just right at the exhibition area, all right? Thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it. We'll do this again next year for sure. This is the first time next year we'll do it again. <laughs>